filling in for Rod Sellers from the uh, Southeast Chicago Historical Society, and I'm Joanne Tadkel. And uh, if you want to know about the mission of the Historical Society, um, fortunately, we have it all laid out right here. <laughs> all right. This is actually a copy of our brochure, but I figured you didn't want to play with it because it's a trifold, and you'd be, you know, working on that part of it. So. Uh, if we start on the side with the photo, uh, I figured we could probably cover the mission of the society and the museum with uh, kind of a general idea. Hey, hi. How are you? Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Hello. Okay. Uh, there's a seat right there, and Mark, are you going to join us? Yes. Oh, Just good. Chair good. Right here. Okay. Can you get it, Martin? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Emily. Oh, we just started. Oh. <laughs> we, we've gotten past hello, I'm, and that's about it. By the way, and I, I kind of want to introduce you, Joanne. Because I don't think everybody here, everybody here but Valerie and Martin, I don't think either one of them knows, knows your background. Oh, okay. <laughs> But I'm going to be, be oh. brief as well because it's not. But anyway, oh, and Pat probably doesn't know your background either. Oh, you can oh, sit Joanne? Here. Yeah. I knew she was a school principal. I thought at Bowen. Yeah. Small she, schools. She was at the small school. And that's when I met her. It was uh, at uh, Bowen Environmental uh, Studies Team. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that for you. Okay. I think one of four small schools, right? Are, do they still have four? No, it's Bowen again. It's Bowen again. Um, but that was uh, at the end of her 40-year uh, career as a social studies teacher. Okay. And, um, and so I got to know her about uh, the time I got to know Rod Sellers. And um, because they were both sending students over to our festivals at Wolf Lake. Testing out the ice. <laughs> oh, thank you. We had, yeah, that was, we, we had some good specials. Oh, you saw your discipline problem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's about a decade in, reti in retirement now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for five years, she was chair of the uh, Kaimit Stewardship Initiative, which is, uh, which is a group that was started by the city of Chicago and the um, uh, Field Museum were probably two of the major and Mary and Mary Burns. And Mary yes. Burns was, was involved in that too, the founding of that. So, um, and then, um, so she's also been worth it working with Kevin um, in his um, helping him with his videography. Well, All right. Is this it? This is it. <laughs> We were on time, honestly. We just couldn't find the room. We couldn't find anybody who knew where this was. Nobody knew anything. Okay. Hi, gang. That's why, that's why you, no, sure. they teach you. People sure. will know something. Teach, oh. teach us directions. Yeah. Yeah. Your, uh, your security didn't know nothing <laughs> anything about the event. Okay. That's okay. Yes, I that's all part of outreach. Yeah. Hi. Hi. But I'm glad you were persistent. Mm -hmm. Did right. yeah, we miss much? No, no. we just started. Hi, okay. gang. Hi. We're just getting started. Good. And I'm filling in for Rod. Where's he today? Uh, he's still hospitalized with uh, oh, West Nile virus. Oh, oh, no. He's doing better. He's doing better. But it's, uh, Any work? Yeah. I'm just finishing inter introducing um, Joanne, and uh, she's helping out over the last five years. Uh, heavens, oh, five years. right? Pretty much so. To capture, I like this to capture environmental arts and general community events in this Kaimet region. And I should, and she's really somewhat of a bi-state gal, I, I think. 
because she reminds me, I can remember when we met the mayor of uh, Hammond, and you were talking, you were related to him, right? Basically. Well, the former mayor. The former mayor, yeah. Wasn't he a McDermott, too? No, not McDermott. Oh, uh, way back to the but she's okay. my cousin's. But she has relatives okay. going from East Chicago to Knox, so that, that yeah, covers well, a one move fairly to large Fort area. Wayne, so it stretches that far now. Oh, okay, almost <laughs> South Bend. Okay. So anyway, and and as as she explained, we recently had uh, Rod Sellers um, uh, as speaker, but um, he's now on leave of absence, I guess. With, dealing with the health issues in West Island. So. so why don't you continue where? where well, you did you want everyone to introduce themselves? I think that's a great idea. Good. And um, I can start. I'm Michael Bowes with the Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative. I'm Stephen Beck. I grew up in Roseland, and I currently live in Calumet City. And my education background is through what used to be Thornton Community College. It's called South Suburban College. I'm Valerie Penninen, and I teach here at CCSJ all history, all the time. Like a continuous <laughs> news station, only it's about the past. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I'm Cynthia O'Gorick. I'm an independent scholar. I call myself a public historian and uh, working on Calumet region history, and I'm based in Calumet City. I'm Mary Kuznier, a lifelong Chicagoan, but I teach at Clark Middle School, High School, and I'm a choir teacher. Kevin Murphy, I'm Joanne's husband. I'm past president of the Southeast Chicago Historical Society and was for 40 years an educator in various institutions, none of them penal. Uh, well, there was a connection one time with one of those. Briefly, we, did a, we did one program for the business system. And I'm mostly doing recording of community events. So. Nice. I'm Mark Martin. Mark Martin. Yes, I was uh, born in the South Shore. Uh, I, I currently live on the East Side, which I have uh, lived uh, most of my life on the East Side, and, and I really like to know more about about the area. Uh, I teach here uh, in the Arts Department, and I uh, am the curator cura cura for all of the art exhibits here. And you're writing a book. Yes, I, and I'm writing a book. In fact, I wrote six pages more last night, so. Wow. No small accomplishment, I can tell you. Yeah. Okay. If it's good, I don't know, but I think it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I got one written yesterday, and I thought that was fantastic. It's been a long time to get that one written. So. <laughs> page. <laughs> one page. Yeah. Mark, you want to move up? Well, sure. <laughs> you don't have to sit back there, Mark. Yeah. You're not being kind Oh, well, I just didn't want to be in the way of the, oh, of the video. Let me worry about that. That's fine. Oh, hi, I'm Pat Hansen, and I was born in South Shore and have been a lifelong resident of the Calumet region and became interested in um, actually the Calumet uh, Heritage Partnership when um, I got an email from Michael Bowles last November and um, kind of drew me into getting more scholarly about the whole thing. Uh, that's it. I'm an artist, too. Cool. And I was a teacher. I'm uh, Paul Petritus, uh, Roseland born, Pullman resident, Chicago historian. I had uh, 16 years at Chicago Historical. Now I'm retired, so I'm on the computer all the time with Forgotten Chicago, Living History of Chicago. Facebook has been my publishing. I'm uh, cleaning my room and scanning maps and photos, and uh, it's not really publishing. But it gets these things out of my head. It's uh, it's, it's all it's the other part of being a community historian. Mm -hmm. And the southeast side is just uh, it's fascinating. You were much connected with the Ridge. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was uh, ED, okay. see, executive director of the Ridge Historical Society over in Beverly, mm -hmm. Morgan Park. But they're only interested in what's. Uh, west of Vincennes, so <laughs> kind of have a bigger worldview than that, but it's kind of fun to run a small historical society for a while. For all the heartaches, it, there's a lot of satisfaction in it, too. Okay, so everybody accounted for? Wow, all the resources in this room, wow. No, really. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. 
Okay, um, this is our brochure. We didn't fold it up, but so I'm saying this is it. So I think we could probably boil uh, what we hope to discuss in three questions. Yeah, what, so what, and what next? That's uh, not original. Okay, um, the building that uh, the Historic Society um, Museum is housed in is the Calumet Park Field House, and the address is 9801 South Avenue G. Um, we're very fortunate to have one room. Uh, the room used to be the side library years and years ago when I was a kid. We still have librarian's desk, which is very nice, and I can still see Miss LaPre looking down at us and kind of watching us. <laughs> we're using the treasures in her space. Okay. Um, we were very fortunate to get that space. One of the park um, supervisors was a neighborhood kid and still is, not a kid anymore though, and uh, he said the room is vacant and if you want to fill it up, fine. So that happened in 1985. So we got that space in 85 and we've been there since. Uh, when Kevin and I walked in in 86, the room was not really as full as it is now. It had one no. four drawer filing cabinet, the desk that Barney uses, and Frank Stanley. Frank Stanley was the president of the organization at that time. Um, Frank was the kind of guy who would just sort of open his arms, wrap you in them, and then you become president of the historical society. <laughs> okay. Um, the society itself started in 1976. And if that sounds familiar, that was the bicentennial year. So everybody was looking at local history. People in our community looked at it and said, wow, you know, with the resources in this room, wow, we have a story to tell, fantastic story to tell. So they started collecting stuff. Uh, Jim Fitzgibbons, who was a neighborhood uh, sort of outreach person, I think he worked for, the, for U.S. Steel. And I guess the, the company policy was get out there in the community. And that's what Frank did, that's what Jim did. Mm -hmm. Jim ran a couple of um, baseball leagues, I think, and, or teams. The Sun Dodgers is one of his teams. And people come in and you know, they relate to that in particular and other things that he did. So it uh, started then in 76 without a space, but with people who were interested in recording material. So our mission from the start was to collect all of these stories and all of the materials. Uh, by 1985, when we got this vacant room, something else had happened that was remarkable. Two professors from Columbia College, Dominic Vasica and Jim Martin, got a grant. And I recently got a little bit more information about that. It seemed that a union leader, Ed Sedlowski, had something to do with that. Um, and the, the grant was to do family and community history. So what better place to start than the southeast side, which didn't have a real record of that, but had four communities. So uh, the four communities were the east side, South Deering, South Chicago, and Hegwish. Cynthia's the expert in Hegwish, okay. Um, and in 81, these gentlemen, well, according to Dominic, and he said this recently, he went to every bingo game, <laughs> <That's what it laughs> is. every church, and asked people to bring their materials uh, so that uh, we could make copies, that he could make copies, and uh, he would have the information that he needed drawn together for this, um, for this particular project. So um, they recorded everything in various forms, put it all together, and collected essentially 100 archival boxes that for a while were stored at Columbia College until I think maybe Dominic went on someplace else and maybe Jim did too and, like, and uh, the college said, we gotta do something with this. And then Kevin you and... Want me to yeah, please. Talk a little bit because it wasn't that easy. It was kind of like a Dan Brown mystery for a long time. We were searching every bank, basement, every building that we followed every rumor for years. It took us about 10 years to get to that Columbia connection. And we were chasing all over the place. People wanted their material back, many of them. They donated it for the project, <laughs> but not the idea of giving it forever. It was, yes, you can use this, we want it back. That was some of them. And we couldn't find it. 
could not find the darn thing. And uh, every rumor turned out to be you know, totally dead-ended. The Holy Grail was still out there someplace. And then we thought, well, it's really a rumor. The thing has just gone up in the smoke. Who knows what happened to it? And one Saturday morning, I think it was Sunday, I'm not sure which, I got a call from Frank early in the morning. He says, I found it. He says, somebody called me from Columbia College and they're about to dump it. We have to move now. I've got a dump truck from the park district. What, can you come? I said, yeah, we're on it. Boom, downtown we went to Columbia College, Wabash Avenue, we're unloading stuff like a bunch of, th a couple of thieves, actually two of us. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> took it back on the dump truck and got it back under cover before the rain started. So it was, it was really a great little adventure that, that, that morning that we, we got it all. The museum would still be one file cabinet, maybe two, and a big desk if it weren't for the fact that we've got all that stuff back from Columbia College. And now it's a sardine can. And we're hoping we can get a bigger sardine can. Sorry about that, sir. No, that's fine. That's fine. No, you're so lucky to have a space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we really are. So many little historical societies are without an address, you know. Yeah. First yeah. time we met Frank in that place, it was like going into McCormick Place and only one person in it at the far end. That's how it seemed to us at the time. <laughs> and now when you go in there, you think, I don't know, can I move in here or not? <laughs> so it totally filled up and vertically, too. But we have it, you're right. Right. Okay, so thanks for that. Okay, um, so everybody knows now where we are, right? Okay, so the next question is, so then in regard to this, so when are we open since we have this marvelous space? That's the problem. We are strictly volunteer, and we are only open on Thursdays from 1 till 4. And if Rod is there, he'll stay maybe a little bit longer. Hi. Have a seat. Oh, okay. Well, we know we know we know the please. Okay, I'll give him a minute. Um, the there's in some additional time when we are there. Down in the basement of the field house, there is a model railroading group, and they have uh, an open house the first weekend of December. So when they're open, we're open. So that's that Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. And that's about it. We used to be open one Sunday a month. Then the park district said it wasn't going to be open on Sunday. So then we stopped and we haven't resumed that. Um, so that, that makes access to our materials kind of limited. But if anyone calls Rod or calls Barney, they usually make sure that uh, it's possible to, to gain access to the to the collection. And I'm talking about names, so let me tell you a little bit about who the volunteers are. Um, right now, the sort of giant in terms of volunteers is Rod Sellers. Rod is a retired uh, Chicago public school teacher. I uh, worked at Washington High School. I worked at Bowen prior to that, and then um, at Washington. He's been pretty much the person who knows where everything is, and he's been the major contact. Um, unfortunately, because of what he's going through right now, we're kind of up in the air. But uh, as you'll see a little bit later when we get to like what's next, how we're kind of, something happened that almost forced us into learning more about what was there than we had before. We're talking now about the, the volunteers. Um, the president of the society, Brian Janecki, is always there when we're open and accessible also. Um, we have uh, someone from Pullman, uh, Jim Ostarello, who discovered us probably about 12 years ago. I think he was newly retired at that time. And he said, there's nothing like this. Uh, he volunteers elsewhere, but he's with us and he's a great asset. Uh, we have Clarence wiggs who is our, what needs to be repaired and by when do you need it? <laughs> When do you need the printer to get the copy of the newsletter or whatever? He's the one who finds all the bargains for us online and uh, does uh, fantastic te technical work for us. Um, other things that you need to know about a couple of these guys, Jim worked at Republic, Clarence worked at Wisconsin, and I think maybe Rod worked for a short time at US, maybe like right out of college or whatever else. So when people come in and, and are interested in knowing about connections to the mills, there's always someone around that can kind of connect to their story. 
Okay, but we have someone else who didn't sure. get Dave an introduction. Deverton. David Deverton. Yeah. <laughs> civilian? Civilian, yes. Okay. And much more. Just civilian. <laughs> no, 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 come on. <laughs> That's all I got <coughs> today. Okay. okay, last month was his turn. <laughs> so if you want to know more about whiting, that's the gentleman to talk to. Okay, so uh, in terms of volunteers, we have just a handful, really. Um, Cynthia is there on a regular basis with her particular project, and that's significant because uh, we do have scholars who come in, and there are certain things that they're interested in. Uh, we connect them with the resources, and then they're kind of on their own. Um, we don't get a whole lot of people coming in at any single time, but um, there are two groups sometimes that comes through also. But when we are open, uh, it's almost always a matter of discovery for the person who comes through the door. Usually they're saying, I had no idea this was here. Okay, well, now you have, what questions do you have, what needs do you have, and how can we help you? Uh, what I find especially charming is that there is a gymnastics group that practices upstairs in what used to be a ballroom. Now they have equipment that's fixed to the floor, so you forget about the ballroom facilities. Uh, but families come for the kids who are in training, and there's almost always a kid who's kind of left out, he's not part of the program, and he wants a place to go, so he wanders in. So there's one little guy in particular who's come in for a couple of weeks now, and when he comes in, it's the same thing. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so what's so wowing about our space? Uh, all kinds of materials, various kinds of artifacts, um, but we have a diorama. Kevy, would you say this is about the size of the diorama? Uh, this, may, yeah, close to it. it. Yeah, it stands higher than this, but yeah, lengthwise I'd say so. Length of width, yeah. Yeah. the streetscape. Yeah, it's magical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one mm -hmm. of our members, John Barron, who also worked with a rebel group downstairs, created this diorama of Commercial Avenue, the Central Business District on the southeast side, uh, and it's based on what he recalled from the 1940s and 50s when the area was perhaps a little bit more prosperous, although we're trying to come back. And he has all the various businesses there, and people will come in and they'll argue, no, Gitters wasn't there, it was over there. Well, in fact, they're both right, it's just that Gitters moved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they talk about other things. And you can look at Green's Bakery and everybody gains five pounds. Because <laughs> okay. everybody remembers all the great stuff that's there. And most of these businesses are gone, but the structures are still there. So the building stock is still there. So there's still a lot that can happen there. Okay, so um, we talked about what the place is, like who's there on a regular basis, like when we're available. Uh, so what? That's the next question. And probably Cynthia could tell you more about the so what. Before you go on, you have to mention the most important thing to us kids, and that is that the streetcars still run from time oh, to time. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Clarence. When they got Clarence, there's the, uh, we have a rail line that runs, and Clarence has made sure to it that the streetcar runs. Fantastic. Okay, yeah, yeah. See, dioramas are falling out of favor with modern museum people, you know, because they're not interactive enough, and, you know, <laughs> but... Yeah, we were at... I worked, at Chicago, I worked at Chicago Historical Society and saw a lot of the great dioramas just go away because they weren't, you know, high tech enough. But there's a certain portion of the public that reacts to a diorama that doesn't get a map, yeah. that can't put themselves in the photo, that's put off by too many words. The dioramas just speak to so many people. Uh, there, that's my bit for dioramas. I love yeah. them. We, we ran into the modern uh, historical librarian kind of thing in Hyde Park where they wanted to erase all evidence that FDR smoked. Yeah. And they were driving the regular like stuff. Robert Johnson, the blues guitar player. Uh, get rid of the car, get rid of everything, and all of it. You know, all of it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, they were. Taste change, but uh, yeah. it's nice to have a variety. Yeah. Well, this diorama, uh, it also captures uh, gold blacks. No gold blood store. I mean, we're we're gonna find another gold blood store, right? So, uh, but uh, it's gone now. Gold blood store is gone now. And there's a little sprawl mart there with the Dunkin' Donuts. Forty uh, seventh and Ashland. And yeah. That might actually be a landmark building, one? though. Wow. Went from Meyer Brothers to Goldblatt's. 
southwest corner of 47th and Ashland. So that's, that's pretty cool. The so building is still there? Yeah, and oh. they're talking about maybe it's a landmark candidate. Yeah, I think ours was, but someone didn't get the paperwork filed in time, and then that was it, it was demolished. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. but when people the come town in with without their, pity here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whenever uh, parents come in Sorry. or grandparents come in with kids, uh, their stories just come out. The stories come out. They're absolutely marvelous. Um, so, let's see. Uh, on the other side of the, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. On the other side, you'll see a little bit about how we fulfill the uh, mission. Uh, yes, Ken Burns actually did come to our historical society. Uh, someone else did, okay, the, I don't know if you're aware of uh, Sarah Paretsky and her uh, Chicago-based, Southeast Chicago-based novel, yes. Detective, <laughs> a Female Detective. Uh, when they were making the movie based on that, they came to uh, take a look at what we had. And I think they used one item. Okay, so you, know, you can take a look at this on, on your own. In regard to uh, artifacts, though, the last steel beam cut at USS when the mill closed in 1992, um, about 10 guys who were totally devastated came in uh, for an interview and they brought that with them. Uh, it was one of the most heartbreaking moments that I can recall. Uh, dress, military, and sports apparel, a lot of Kevin's uh, uniforms are there, so they all say Murphy on them. <laughs> 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 but there are other things. Uh, a strange item, that third item that's listed under artifacts, a porthole from the East one. Oh my gosh. Uh, but as uh, we sort of investigated that, it was, that came off the East one before it capsized. It was found in um, a repair place where one of uh, our followers uh, worked and he brought it in, gave it to us. And we, we uh, had it out on loan. Oh. I think there's a, an Eastland Museum, I think it's in Wheaton, I may be wrong, but they had um, a display and they, they borrowed it for a while. But it is a conversation piece. What also is a conversation piece is where those people were going. They were going to St. Joe's, Michigan. So we had an article about the Carousel Museum there and that's connected with it too, so that people can kind of relate to that. Okay, various collections, so all of those materials, uh, 100 archival boxes have all kinds of lovely things in them. We have daily calumets, not all of them, sad to say, because people are often looking for materials from the daily calumet, but from 60 to 79. Uh, we have almost all of the Bowen High School yearbooks, uh, and people are often trying to find their parents in the yearbooks or their stories in the yearbooks. Uh, that's, that's very uh, popular. Uh, we have some Washington High School books, but we don't have the full co uh, collection on that. Um, so you can kind of take a look and get an idea on that. We work with other organizations a great deal with Ollie. You, you provided us, Michael, with a, kind of a stage for many of the uh, presentations that Rod has done over the years, and um, Kevin and myself also. So thank you for that. Uh, we're also part of uh, the Calumet Stewardship Initiative and the Calumet Heritage Partnership. Uh, these have been significant. Others, um, the Southeast Environmental Task Force usually ask Rod to help with tours, some with not such uh, tempting names, but sort of interesting, like down in the dumps. I mean, what other That's part of town can offer something like that, right? <laughs> <coughs> okay, educational activities. Uh, there's one that's not mentioned here. When I was teaching uh, social studies at Washington, that was about the time that we had uh, this gift of 100 archival boxes. Surprise, surprise, there was no catalog. So the question was, now how to keep track of all this material? Uh, and Ken O'Neill, who taught with Rod at Washington, uh, taught social studies, said, well, what if we tried to get a gifted program class for our students and had them actually go through all these photos, find out what's on the back or whatever, and catalog them themselves? 
out of that came a class called Museology. And uh, the students did get credit for it. It was an after school What's that class. Word? It was Museology Deaf. Oh, oh. I think that's a word that Rod coined himself. Because without the they, second M? No, museology. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, without the second M. Museology, okay? Museology. Uh, and the kids got credit. Uh, the program lasted far beyond the cataloging time. But wouldn't you know it, after the kids had cataloged everything, someone at Columbia discovered the catalog, oh. <laughs> the original one. So then the next year's project was to compare what the students had written down with what the experts had written down in the original uh, collaboration. Were any brains changed? <laughs> that wasn't their fault. It, you know, we didn't hold the kids responsible. They were they did the best they could with what was there. But what was what was neat about the museology class was that it, it was a joint effort, wasn't it, between Washington High School and Bowen High School? Did, weren't students it was offered to more than uh, Washington, but it was more convenient for Washington students because okay. most of them lived on the east side. Uh, Bowen students were mostly South Chicago, uh, Jeffrey Manor. Oh, there were a few, yeah, there were a few uh, Bowen students who also participated. Yeah, thanks for the reminder on that. High it school was seniors? A, uh, high school students who were uh, in honors programs. But that's what the gifted program offers for a lot of that's students cool. through the, you know, the other programs uh, at uh, the aquarium, uh, the planetarium, whatever else. So it wasn't unusual. It was, just, it was just this specific space had need nice. at that time. And that worked out nicely. Uh, when Rod retired, there was an attempt to continue that program, but it didn't work. <laughs> so we don't have that anymore. Uh, but in terms of educational activities, that's part of it. Um, Rod is, um, at that time, in collaboration with some of the other uh, teachers that he worked with at Washington, put together some tours, some walking tours. So we do have a walking tour of the Southeast Side. I think there's one in South Chicago. Um, and other tours came out of that, so Rod's been very active over the years with various tours. We also have something that's sort of parallel to this. Uh, it's a Green Summit tour that came out of um, CSI. Uh, we were discovering that there were many things that were green that we weren't really celebrating. So Michael's been very supportive of this program. We worked with Clarice and Associates in South Chicago, which has actually built green buildings, affordable green houses and has um, created um, a couple of um, senior homes that are totally green. So you get to South Chicago and see the solar panels and some of the buildings that Solution Associates have been active in regard to that. Uh, so we have that tour and usually the month of May is when we celebrate green buildings, green gardens, and green open space. And the southeast side is very rich on all those. Oh, another thing very quickly. When the society began, it was simply called the East Side Historical Society. And then someone from South Deering, one of our presidents, as a matter of fact, said, well, it's not just the East Side, is it? <laughs> it's just Alex Avistano, who was uh, 90 what when he finished being? <laughs> Alex was 91 when, uh, I think, when he finished. And it was funny, he'd been the longest serving president at the time, so at our annual dinner, he says, you know, he says, I've enjoyed this, you guys, but he said, I've got a life to live. I've got to get on with other stuff. So, and he did. And then he went out, and his son had a pizza, an amazing pizza place in which part of Oklahoma? Tulsa. Okay, in Tulsa. And he would go out there and work with, the, with his son, and it's a huge place. And, and it's Chicago-style pizza in Tulsa. The place is just, you know, it's like a gold mine. And so Alex would go out there and everybody, you know, oh God, Alex is coming, you know, so he did, he went on, he went on for another several years. And did just yeah, so he was work. the one who said, you know, I'm from South Deering, the title of this organization doesn't suit me. So then it became the Southeast Historical Society, and Kevin looked us up and ended up in Florida. When he went to the internet, he said, yeah. wait a minute, wait, wait, something's missing here. So now we are at the Southeast Chicago. No, it was West Virginia. But it was, yeah. West Virginia, okay, so yeah. the point was that we, become very, very specific now. You got your brand. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have um, a quarterly newsletter.
that goes out and is chock full of all sorts of information. Uh, between Barney and Rod themselves, they can tell you how busy they've been and all the various things that are happening. Uh, uh, we also have an annual dinner. Ah, that's what I forgot. That's what I forgot to bring today. Okay, we have dinner? an annual dinner <laughs> with a theme. Got my attention. With the theme, okay. And uh, this most recent theme was authors. So we put together this, we put together this giant size, giant economy size bookmark, and we're very pleased to distribute it to various authors, okay, when they arrived at the dinner. Uh, so these are people who live and write in the area. So you're going to be on next year's, right? I it hope says so. to be continued on there. Okay, and <laughs> Cynthia's yeah, already ready. on it, right? Okay, there you go. All right. Oh, you have two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to want another one Okay. And I think we're going to have to cross over to Northwest Indiana, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so it's people who live and work in the area, or they're people who have used the area. Okay, one of the amazing, well, they're all amazing. They're truly amazing. Kevin Singh was on here, too. Um, the third one, Rita Arias grew up in South Deering. Uh, her parents were leaders in the Hispanic community. She taught at Bowen with Carlos Tortolero. Carlos? How long did he teach? Carlos. Uh, it's hard for me to recall. He got a job downtown, and then he and another former Bowen teacher, I mean, they gave up their teaching jobs, moved into a boathouse in a park district in Pilsen Little Village. And now, Helen left, but Carlos stayed on with the organization, and it's the, what do they call it now, the National Mexican, Mexican, Mexican Museum. Museum. Yeah, yeah. So talk about having a small space and then taking this to new heights. Uh, I mean, that, that's absolutely amazing. Okay, but there are other amazing stories related to the people who are listed here. Okay, yeah, Sarah Poretsky's down there. She, uh, Sarah Poretsky had one, uh, uh, one scene where her star, her um, female detective gets into some I'm trouble. Sure yeah, and, and, yeah, thank you. And ends up rolled up in a carpet at Dead Stick Pond. Uh, I mean. <laughs> and lived to tell about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because someone walked their dog out there. I said, I never remember seeing anybody at Dead Stick Pond walking their dog. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Klukowski, too. Oh, yeah, Jim Klukowski, there. sorry, Jim Klukowski, um, connected with the original Columbia College project. I don't know if he was a student or if he still had connections there, but he worked with Dominic and also Jim Martin on that. And I think Jim helped to make some of the connections that brought together a lot of the interviews. Jim is still alive and well, a photographer, lives on the east side, uh, and has written at least one book about the southeast side called South Chicago, USA. It's uh, about his family, but it's about the larger community also. And now he's writing a... No, no, you said that, I didn't hear it. So. He told us recently that he was writing a murder mystery. He has Kevin and me in it, and he says um, he's not too sure about who's going to get murdered, and I'm thinking, why did he mention us to begin with? <laughs> he is largely focused on the photography of the area, so his books have little text in them, but the text is excellent. Um, I did a review for the Times when I was still working for them, and it was amazing. I looked at it and I thought, it's all pictures, what am I looking at this one? And then I saw his text about the area. It was about 10 or 11 pages, but it's gold. I mean, he really hits it with what he did. So, the, but the visual aspects of it, he, the guy's great. He's also a location manager, like for ER and things like that. If for, um, oh. see, Prancer, the movie Prancer, things like that. So he's been a location manager for TV and, and movie companies as well. He's, you got, it's like the region has an awful lot that the world doesn't know about because it only knows about the hard, heavy head hammers of the industry here, but it doesn't know what the people who operated those hammers have, have done in their spare time. I used to cover theater out here for the Times, and it was, I was their theater columnist for about 14 years, and I'd cover all the regional theaters here, and I thought, my God, we're getting better stuff. And I covered also Steppenwolf and, and Court and other theaters at the same time. And 
Galpo, for instance, was mounting a better production of, of streetcar than the one that had uh, Gary Sinise in it, in my opinion, as a reviewer. And I like Sinise, but he didn't have it for that. And the guy who was doing it out there, I thought, my God, this is amazing. We saw a couple of productions like that where they out did step them over. <laughs> the world doesn't focus on that. If we get somebody shot in a street corner, whoa, 27 people have died in the South, you know, in the Calumet region, or mostly in South Chicago, but we get the press for that. There's a lot more going on. That's one of the reasons we do this kind of stuff, to, to kind of balance the scale a little bit. But there's so much talent here that we, we don't spotlight enough, in my opinion. Uh, speaking of talent, okay, uh, people like Cynthia are writing books about the area. This is another kind of a, you know, so, so you know, what? Well, <laughs> people are actually using the materials. Uh, Once Upon a Time in South Chicago was written by Rob Stanley, Frank Stanley's son, who gives credit at the beginning of this to Kevin, which I dropped, I shouldn't have had him, uh, because Frank Stanley had his uh, account of World War II, but he also had his father's account of World War I. When Rob came back from Vietnam, he found his mother had kept all of his letters. So he wrote the third part of a book that is really just sitting in the museum. It was never published. But it's fantastic because you see the character of these three men, three generations of the same family, reflected in what happens to them during the war. Forgive uh, me, Rob, but I need to do that again. Frank did not have his written. Frank was the first president of the Historical Society, and he was the guy who would get your story, and your story, and your story, and your story, we better get them written down. We could not get it out of him. His father's story from World War I was very nicely done, very well done. It was just memoirs when he got finished. And Frank showed it to me, it was very impressive. And then Rob's was written, kind of in a rough form. Couldn't get Frank's. I mean, it was like pulling teeth out of a, out of a dinosaur that's alive still. You know, he was just, we finally got it, and Frank, his father had written something like 70 pages of World War I, and it was really impressive stuff. Rob had written tons of stuff that, you know, from his letters on Vietnam, and Frank gave us 14 pages. And it was like, you know, I was in the World War, and he was in the, the war longest of anybody, you know, in World War II, gone through PT, both, gone through, got washed out of Navy training because he was too good a pilot, I think. Um, he did what he should have done, saved a plane, and they washed him out because he didn't know where he was at the moment, and he had no equipment to find out where he was. He had no, you know, no long story. Anyway, um, it was very difficult to get Frank to write a lot. And so finally, finally, we got him in front of video cameras. And I mean, I would rather go and hunt, out, hunt Capone, I think, than try to get Frank to do something after that. But uh, we finally got him recorded, and then was able to draw some of that into the, the history that he did. because. It wasn't just, I went to the Pacific and I came home, you know, he, there was a little bit more than that. He was, while well, they washed him out of the naval training at, at Glenview for not being able to navigate, he navigated the PT squadron all over the Pacific. I think that's a lot easier, more difficult than trying to navigate across the darkened side of Chicago without any instruments. But, anyway, I'll go on forever about Frank, but uh, we finally got him in the book. But it was hard, so it was first his dad, then Rob, and finally Frank. And Frank was a dude. So the mystery, I'm sorry, the message in that is, wow. as historians, get people out there with cameras, get their histories, get it recorded, because, and especially, and make sure you get yours in there too, because probably you have a story to tell too. This was Frank, his, he had a great story, but it was difficult to get him to do it. He was too we busy found getting we all had to soften up our World War II vets when we were at uh, the Rich Historical Society. So we had a year-long uh, exhibit, the home front, the battle front. And we had it divvied up in the Eastern, ETO, PTO, Eastern Theater, Pacific Theater. And we would have, uh, we had six vets with their stuff featured, each one in a case. So they could come in and stand in front of their thing and tell their story. And uh, we also had uh, events so that we could get vets together. Some of these guys still fit in their uniform, you know. Some of them. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. There he is. But we're sitting there, and the guys are giving their story about the uh, kamikaze. They like to pronounce it that way. Uh, and they're talking about various things that happened on that battleship. 
one of these guys in the second row stands up. He says, I was there. And his wife looks at him and his son looks at him. He goes, well, I might as well tell the story. And he let go for 20 minutes. He hadn't said a word. Not so it, it, you've yeah. got to, the care and feeding of a World War II vet was something else. You know, we had, we, we treated it like an officer's mess. We had a, an all-male staff. We cooked for them. For the European theater, it was German beer. Uh, for the uh, Pacific theater, it was Thai food and Australian beer. And it, it's something to pull it out of some of these guys because they they just, they yeah. just, they don't, they don't want to let it go. Yeah. And, uh, Were you able to get that recorded? Frank, yeah. Yeah, yeah there, oh, there's fantastic. recordings there. Um, some of those vets are still alive. We did that in 2002. Fantastic. But uh, it wasn't a dry eye in the house because this guy just let go. He goes, yeah, I was in the ammo dump and the plane landed on top of me where I was about. Wow. So that was cool. That was kind of the high point when I was director there because uh, they weren't too interested in doing exhibits. It's a house museum. They're more interested in wallpaper. And, <laughs> And teas. Oh, really? Just, okay, it's wow. it, 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 it's, it's Beverly. It's a different world out there. Yeah, we're, we're a little grittier on the south side. I think side, so. Yeah. I think so. But uh, well, the care and feeding of those vets is. Uh, there, real quick. I'll find you that tape. Uh, oh, wait, there were some things that um, Rob included in his portion that were about the community. It was like uh, being trained on the southeast side so that you can go and fight in Vietnam. And what Rob did is he pulled that stuff out of the original source and put them into his own book, which you can only buy at local watering holes. So you have to go to the shed where the Vietnam vets hang out, yeah. uh, or some other place, the O'Hara's or whatever. But Rob is now the vice president of the Historical Society, which is absolutely marvelous because his dad had been one of the founding members of it. And if you look carefully, this is another thing that happens. You notice this is a football photo, Bonivers, mm -hmm. okay, which is like a magic word over at the museum. If you look carefully, you will see Rod, Rod Stanley in here and Rod. So Rod made it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked, he asked, he showed me that. The question, our next meeting, are we going to the bars to find <laughs> <laughs> We can give you a map. Just <laughs> As a matter of fact, you may have a map in there. Okay, so this is another thing, another lovely thing that's happening is that this next generation is writing its story. Uh, so Carolyn Mulek's name is listed here. Her father was also president of the Historical Society and a well-known artist in the area. Um, she's now the, the treasurer of the organization. Her book has to do with, um, it's not about the area. Her background is in libraries, so it's more of a reference kind of book for librarians. But um, this next generation is making its mark. Another one, I didn't bring the book, but another one that is highly significant and will be my bridge to the last part of what, so what, and what next. I'm going to let that go for a little bit, but her name is on here. Uh, Christine Wally. It's toward the bottom, dear alphabetical Christine Wally, but I'll say a little bit more about that. Oh, you brought it. Oh, bless you, bless you. I just you. finished it Monday. I, oh, you said that on the way in, and I didn't think you'd have it with you. Yeah. You made him bring it. In Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was okay, but also about our dinners, just real quick. Another dinner that we had, and this is what I forgot to bring, not this, obviously. You're like, why oh, that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we did... Uh, Movies, movie theaters, and movie sites on the southeast side. And Rob uh, found all of these uh, incredible photos of silent movie theater fronts and movie theaters that we used to go to when we were kids that are long gone. Uh, so out of that, this was one of the posters that we put together. The movie theaters, the Gaby Theater, which had the ice cream parlor and candy shop right next door. And that part of the business is still alive and well and living in Lansing. And Lansing and Highland? It's right around the border of the <laughs> But they crossed in, in yes. Indiana recently, yeah. yes. And, and that's the original. Enough, they were kind enough to uh, send a donation to the 90th anniversary of the South Chicago Chamber of Commerce. The biggest box of candy I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we did that, and then we, we did also the movie sites, 
and we still have this exhibit up. So there are about 30 some posters of uh, the movie theaters and also the sites. And I will tell you this, I had no idea we had that many people who have been extras or who uh, let their cars be used or who painted sets or whatever else for these movies. But the one uh, that some of the people in our community are still fixated with at whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> the blues mm -hmm. About two weeks about two weeks ago I met I met Dan Aykroyd. No! And you didn't steal him and bring him no. here for us? <laughs> Martin, you have to go back and do that for us, okay? <laughs> and I was I was there when they jumped the bridge. Oh I, 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 this is perfect. Who set this up? Which Who set bridge? this up? 95th Street. Oh, 95th Street. 95th Street. I mean, there's, there's still people. They cross the bridge and they're thinking they're the Blues Brothers yeah, or whatever. And so, so much of that was filmed around the city and plus Harvey. Yeah. yeah. The Dixie Square, which they now blew up. Yeah. yeah. They imploded it. Yeah. But they, yeah. Everything yeah. In this they rebuilt yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So the fun we had with this, uh, uh, that was our dinner theme a couple of years ago. So Kevin and I are coming back from some place and we're about to... Uh, lose our last chance to turn into South Chicago. And I said, you know, the dinner's coming up, and it's about movies. And, well, who's going to do the Blues Brothers? And he looks at me like, what are you crazy? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, what does it take? A black suit and a black hat? Sunglasses? You know, yeah, we can do that. Dry, dry toast and three chickens? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you look out at the dinner. Oh, <laughs> uh, if you read the book, the book has things that aren't in, in, in there, like Curl Up and Die. Curl Up and Die, uh, yeah. That's, 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 that's I actually do have the Blues Brothers book. Yeah, and, and, there, and there's the, Ralph, the this is the Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Or the movie. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fantastic, right? Okay, so anyway, we're just coming home, and I said, you know, I have, I have a hat that would sort of pass for black, but you don't have a hat. So there's this wonderful place called Bernard's on Commercial Avenue. And he says, well, we've never been in there. I said, who cares? Let's go. So we walked in, and what happened? No, don't ask me. I wasn't there. <laughs> I was just the victim, right? Exactly what he wanted, and out of all his shelves or whatever, <coughs> he pulled it out. So he wore it to the dinner. So both of us are there, and uh, someone came up and said, well, okay, so who's Jake and who's Elwood? Well, we had them be, because we had our names printed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot. That that display is still up and it still brings you know terrific comments from people. Is Trumbull Park part of your or your? Yeah, because it uh, it's up here. You know, Dick Gregory wrote a book and lived there in Trumbull Park, and he's still oh. among the living. Whoa! Wow. He wrote about you know the, the ethnic change and you know when he was commuting between Trumbull Park and uh, the Playboy Mansion. Wow. Is he still in the Chicago area? Mm, I don't think so, but he's still living. Hmm. Wow. There's a guy. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, we have, yeah. Um, we have all kinds of records related to, to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that, this could be part of the story. Speaking of movie people, is Robert Zemeckis on there? Or do you include Lozen as part of that? We're on the no, other side no. of Lake County. Uh, well, no. I thought maybe it... We share the lake, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, there were people at Bowen who knew him. Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, he was the librarian aide when he was a student for one of, uh, for the mother of one of our teachers. Because he went to, Fanger. Went, went to St. Fanger. Willowbrook Grade School. And then Fanger, Fanger High School. Yeah. Which is where yeah. Paul he and his, he and his dad went to Fanger. Whoa. He was probably the most, uh, the least famous, successful person from Rosa. Everyone thinks of sticks, but Robert Zemeckis never gets any attention. <laughs> and he did all these movies. Yeah. 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 Forrest wow. Gump, etc. Wow, wow. Okay, lots, lots of, okay, so movies, uh, pop culture leads to a lot of uh, connections. Yeah, and really we get a lot of people come in uh, who say that they were extras in these various movies. And I don't know if funny or do we know who comes into the museum from time to time? He was in Public Enemy. Uh, he saw a notice in the uh, Northwest Indiana Times, if you're interested, show up, have a headshot, whatever, he went. And we actually have a photo of him. And I said, so, so where were you in the movie? He saw the movie, and so where were you? So it's the Michigan City scene, where Dillinger is saying, oh, I'll be out of here in no time. 
in charge of the uh, reporters. And Tony says, yeah, the camera came right here. It's, it's like two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, but uh, Christine Wally, okay, this is like the kind of part of the what next. Um, Christine Wally grew up on the southeast side. Um, her uncle was one of my classmates. Her mom was maybe uh, two years ahead of us at Bowen. And uh, sometimes in between, uh, I met her mom at the supermarket or whatever, and she said, oh, my daughter got a scholarship to Exeter. Wow, it's fantastic. And uh, sometime later she said, my daughter's an anthropologist at MIT. She wants to do some work in this area. Oh, gee, you know, I was just kind of stunned and didn't know what to say. So what happened is that Christine and her husband, whose first name is also Chris, uh, are videographers and anthropologists and are interested very much in what happened to Christine's family as a result of the closing of Wisconsin. That's the book. Exit Zero is sort of uh, identifying the place where the Wally family lived. And the book tells you the devastating effect that the closing of that mill had. Uh, that Christine was able to turn her life around by this chance application that she made to Exeter when her friend was applying. I think her friend didn't get it. And Chris got it, and that changed her life. So now, in payback, Christine, who found a lot of the material that she was looking for for her book at a historical society museum, uh, has connected us with MIT and a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant. Um, over the last couple of weeks, Diane Hugh, who is uh, an archivist, has been working with our materials and trying to sort us out a little bit better than we've been able to sort us out over the last uh, 20 some years, whatever. Um, and the next phase, because they'll have to apply for another branch, will be to finally get us a decent website. The website we have now, if you go to it, dead ends. It was created when Brad was part of a Northeastern Illinois University program on the built environment. So they helped us to get website access. But it, it never went beyond that because whoever we were working with at that time went on to something else. And so we're just sort of been hanging out there. You can't add anything to the website now. Yeah. But MIT is working with us and has promised it. So that's sort of like what's next. Another part of what's next is this may not be totally recognizable to anybody who's looking at it, but these are the ore walls. This is what's left of USX. And those are developers right there. <laughs> and this is also uh, along the, the slip where the ships would come in and the the materials that they would need at the mill over the winter will be dumped in between two sets of ore walls. So these are 40 feet high, at least two blocks long. A thousand feet? And there are two sets of them. Uh, the developer tried to remove part of it. You can see a little bit of bug out at one point. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if they're going to keep both sets up. But um, the point is that this is going to progress. They don't call it South Chicago, which is where it is. They call it Lakeside Development. Uh, and um, we'll, they've already been sort of working with us a little bit in regard to some of the history of the mill, because most of the people are just Canadian. <laughs> so um, there will be a statue commemorating the school workers. Uh, it will be done all because that part is done. Um, the artist work is done. It's from Goliath. Uh, who worked in the mill, got to the school at age 17. His dad said, you're not sitting there. Uh, got him a job at the mill, so he knows the mill culture. And he has created this uh, very touching statue that will be bronze. He wanted it to be uh, limestone, which is what he was used to working with. The park district said, not outside. Your choices are granite or bronze, so no, not good for bronze. But he had 
the model for this. It's 10 feet high, just the statue itself. And it'll be on a four foot base, so it'll be enormous. And it will be at 87th Street and the lake, which is Park District. And, and Roman insists that it face west into the future. Um, and I think our historical society is also sort of facing that way. You want a picture of it? You got Roman statue. Yeah. You're, you're on the ball. <laughs> 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 I was just I was just there covered that on video Monday with Michael, Roman. We have the, the meeting where Roman actually showed the uh, the, the prototype statue yeah. is on video with one of the lake it's a lakeside on one of the videos that we have on the site. Okay. So it's a, you can get a, a larger view of that sort of stuff if you want to take the time to look at those things. Okay. It is up there. We we covered some of that those meetings, so it's uh, <clears throat> He's done, he did it 20 That was years. very interesting because this is the first time he's done bronze. So I was yeah. telling, I was talking to him, I think yesterday or I think I was there. What today is? Tuesday? Maybe yesterday. And so um, and so he said, well, the guy from where they're going to do the bronze came out and was advising him how to prepare the, the statue and, and told him, gave him some advice on how to better pre prepare it for him. So, and he's just, the only thing he's got left to do is uh, coat it with some sort of spray um, before he ships it off. But Thank you, Michael. It's perfect. How did you know that we'd be talking about that? You're getting good marks here for production. I just, I was, I was talking to, you got the book. Or, yeah. I emailed Christine. She's coming out for that dedication. And we were trying to um, get her to come here and, and talk at the forum. Oh, that would be fine. Um, yeah. if, if we can do that, we may have to have, to have it at some other time or something, yeah. but it would be good to get her. And in fact, I, we might, what I was thinking of doing, it was if they brought the film with them, because they're, they're doing a uh, documentary, uh, we could present it at the, uh, in the box, black box theater. Yeah, it'd be lovely. Would that be? Cause I went to the Field yeah. Museum about two years ago when we all went. Mm -hmm. it was about two years ago, was it? Yeah, it was and they showed it there. Is it finished? Oh, really? They, they, they finished? Uh, she said they're still doing the final touches to it, but I think it's kind of like a manuscript. You just keep keep <laughs> at it. But because the version that we saw at the Field Museum seemed to be a little rough, and. Yeah, and well, they admitted that. Yeah, I didn't realize which view you were showing. We have a different video with him and his and an associate, where they take the big block yeah. of styrofoam and they begin to cut it, and in the doing it, they give a, an art class. Yeah, well, they, that's not their intention. Yeah, but they're giving us an art class on carving this thing. Yeah, and so that's another one that's up there where they actually walk through it. And you begin to see the rough cut. Well, this is fantastic by comparison, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're it's getting that. close with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, another thing that we do at the museum is to try to support uh, community organizations um, with uh, tours, presentations, whatever. And um, right now, I'm a member of the South Chicago Chamber Board, uh, celebrating its 90th anniversary. So for their kickoff, we did this. <laughs> and all that qualified were the businesses that are gone. Uh, uh, this was a little bit that we, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, we found something uh, in a series of postage stamps about working class people or whatever. Stole it because it nicely fits our area. And then we found ad about various businesses, uh, including Cole and Young, which is not inside Chicago, but it is also in Lansing. Okay, then uh, early mill properties when it was called not USX or US, but instead Carnegie Illinois. Uh, then of course, <laughs> now Southwest qualifies as one of the ghosts. So here we go. Uh, we also have one of our landmarks in South Chicago is the Columbus statue, 
which was a uh, castaway from downtown. But the Italians in the community said, ah, uh -uh, we want it. We we're fortunate enough to have two shots of it, like two decades apart. So it shows you the monuments, like the monuments, the only thing that was standing there. Uh, there was a hotel just beyond it, uh, but you know, 20 years later, the hotel is gone and South Chicago Bank was there. So essentially the hotel had been on the um, parking lot. Also, the post office, the old classic style post office, which is also gone. Okay, and now there's, excuse me, I think there's a, a senior center there. Yeah, Mahalia Jackson, senior residence. Huh. Okay. Um, then we've got four views of 92nd and commercial over time. The only thing that's consistent in all four is the Washington Hotel, which if you went to South Chicago, you had trouble finding this three-story structure because they had a fire and they had to cut down the top two stories. But the first story is still there and it has businesses in it. Um, this is a kind of a bizarre photo. We had both East and West on 92nd Street merged. A little tricky with a um, streetcar. Uh, this one we call Ships and Fish because it shows you... Uh, is it on Fridays only? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you go to Cabinet Fisheries, which is like any day, right? Okay, but there are like three sections to this. Uh, the first section has to do with the lighthouse that was there. Um, the next one has to do with the shipbuilding industry, which is a really like east side. And the third one the is 95th Street. Can I see the lighthouse? Uh, this one is called The Media. We relied on the Calumet place. for all of our information and also uh, a radio shop. Um, old department stores, uh, Cave and also the New York store. Um, if we thought Goldblatt's was like the only department store of any size, it was preceded by letterers on the same site probably 1902 or so, and then Goblatz bought the building and converted it uh, from something that looked very Victorian to something that looked very Art Deco, at least in our area. Um, then we just put together a lot of variety stores, including Cole and Young, so we were very happy that uh, Bonnie Malo was able to join us. This is a photo from Cole and Young at their current location, and look at the date, 1874. Not that the same family has the business, but the point is that the business is going on. And then we saw something off Lonnie's website <laughs> about the business. Uh, clothing stores plus how, uh, Robert Hall, I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, Red Robin, everybody's store. Okay. Um, okay, sources of dinner's main course. We've got a couple of uh, butcher shops and looks like a sausage maker. Some of these were not identified. That's another problem that we have. Sometimes we have photos and we have mm -hmm. nothing really to identify it precisely. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Best of both worlds. Yeah. <laughs> Tabasa tortillas. <laughs> Polish Mexican connection. Yeah. Uh, so polka sausage and. Do they sell those at pierogi fest? Yeah, I can't believe what they're putting into pierogies. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? They, cross cultural stuff is marvelous. But the tortilla factory um, was probably started in the 30s or so. And you could see them sort of coming out, and it was really just a humble little storefront. And it turned out I did not know this until fairly recently that one of uh, my classmates at Bellman, that was her mother's shop. Oh, yeah, well, you know, we talk about things like that at school, right? Okay, this is fine dining, the Paris restaurant. And we have a uh, low-risk menu on here with incredible prices, right? Now, all this, all this came out of our collection, okay? And, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, South Chicago desserts. Mr. Papa George at Gaty's. Mr. Papa George, who was always there smoking his cigar. I grew up thinking ice cream smelled like cigars. <laughs> and the bottom photo says greens? Greens, yeah. Was that a department? No, branch greens, store? greens was a bakery. bakery. Oh. Fantastic stuff. 
uh, and a few watering holes from South Chicago hickeys. And actually, it's only the 79th uh, in South Chicago. We don't think about that. It's South Chicago, but it is. Um, a place called the Kickapoo Inn. Oh, sure. Yeah. Buried right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you wanted to see that theater reproduced, you could go to Elmhurst. You know, they have a theater museum in Elmhurst on your Pro. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, it's just something. That was a beautiful theater. Yeah, it's still there, as a matter of fact, but it's not a movie theater, the Avalon Theater. Yeah. Right, yeah, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's still there. It's Regal. No, no, no. It's the Regal Theater. They've been trying to build concerts there. Uh, other things that are kind of gone from the community, the trolley, and also the IC. When you talk to kids and you mention the IC, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's the Metro now. Yeah, it's the Metro. And, yeah, and then this is our last photo. The funeral homes. So <laughs> some of these are uh, other businesses. As a matter of fact, this one is a couple of doors away from the chamber. I'm not quite sure what they're using it for. Grizzles became brewers, camera shop for a while. So that's you know it shows you how uh, the materials that are in the collection are still. Oh, I don't know if anybody's back there. That's it. Very good. This is, Thank all, you. this is all stuff that they collected for the Columbia College project. You're still uh, working off of those 100 boxes. Have, has most of this come in? Or? Uh, most of this is that, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, and thank you, Cynthia, because about half of our collection is from the Columbia College, College Project. Oh, okay. The rest are straight donations to the museum. And there, there's tons of stuff. There's tons of stuff. So. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, any questions or whatever? Oh, thank you, Paul, uh, Paul for uh, mentioning what you did with the um, veterans because our Rod had been saying that he would like our next dinner to be dedicated to the home front. Yeah. And it was the home front, the battle front. So we had all of these uh, ways to stretch your meatloaf. Uh, you know, all, all these horrible recipes. I mean, just. <laughs> we grew up on it. What do you mean? <laughs> some, some of these, uh, some of these vets says, I never want to see rice sticking out of a meatball again. <laughs> Just like S S O S and the other things that they really don't want to ever eat again. Um, but you know the, the the cans for the grease drive. Um, you know they they collected everything, and a lot of things went away for those. Uh, those material drives for the aluminum and so. And an old good housekeeping cookbook from 1944 that has some of those recipes in it. Butterless, eggless, milkless cake. What's that? Cooking. Basically, there was, there was it was meatloaf like surprise, and what was surprised on the inside is, is a hard boiled egg. Oh. Maybe. That was after the war, even. I remember those. Oh, boy. An olive loaf, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. Chris, some people even like Spam, so you never know. Oh, mm -hmm. that me. Yeah. My brother, my mm -hmm. brother, in his uh, later it. years, uh, started eating Spam. We kept telling him, Stanley, you better not do that, you know? And I, oh, no, it's good, it's good, it's good. Well, we lived to eat them. It's not bad. <laughs> Well, I have to congratulate any historical society that keeps active. The hardest thing is to get young members. No. So, we have been so, very, so you last very more pleased. than a decade. We've been very pleased, and that has been our major concern, because uh, if you look at average age of presidents, well, Kevin was like the youngest, yeah, here we uh, are. they were uh, well past retirement age and um, fragile. But like Alex, you know, he had a life after that. Ninety-one, he goes up. But, but that kid that comes down with nothing to do when his brother's doing the gym stuff, you know, you got him. Yeah. yeah. Because it's such a small percentage. I, I was lucky. I had a great AP history teacher at Fenger. She went on to be principal of Eisenhower High School. Just oh God, what, what a woman. Um, and I talked to her later on when I was working at Chicago Historical. I wanted to tell her that I'd done good. She said, yeah, there's three of you now. 
So what? <laughs> she said, yeah, I taught AP history for 30 years and only three of you went into the business. <sighs> so but you, but it, you don't know how enriched the lives were of those you, who didn't go into know. that business right. but more better They people may still be buying business. books and they may still be, you know, going to Civil War battlefields and stuff. Yeah. And maybe history consumers, but, yeah. you know, you don't know where the uh, next director's coming from. It might be that kid. Because yeah. you got to grab them in those uh, just post pubescent years. You know, they really, history is cool. Yeah. Dave, what do you well, I have a question? Oh, first thing. What happens if, if Poland becomes a national park? And I keep reading that they're going to have a museum that's really going to focus on, I guess they're going to do private industry. What happens to you? Oh, we're not concerned. We're not concerned. Uh, would you thank you because that's that something. Or? I forgot about that part. Uh, Millennium Reserve, which is uh, you can feel the ground soil. It's not just Indiana, it's southeast Chicago. It goes all the way up to the Field it's Museum. It's the new umbrella. Yeah. And uh, so it's we're ready at the museum to uh, begin to do a considerable amount of signage. But I think that the entire area is going to be uplifted as a result of it. And I see this as a plus. Um, when we talk about Steel Museum, though, it's still it's still focused pretty much on Southeast Chicago. Pullman has its own history, and in fact, we've also got the the, the petting zoo of, uh, of all those the steel industry artifacts. The, yeah, the, those which Brad helped. Yeah. To collect yeah, along with we, we've Mark Pullman and stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think we have enough in the way of materials, and it may it may attract other things like that. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. Well, not worried, but wouldn't it make sense to contact and maybe have them do something with yours as well? Well, we have. Part of that? Yeah. We have. Yeah, yeah. We, we know about these guys. That. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're as a matter of fact, if you go back in history, James Harvey Bowen, who is the father of South Chicago, was a buddy of yeah, George Coleman. Yeah. So there's a. There are no Bowen papers anywhere. I, I have yet to find his biography. His daughter wrote a biography. His daughter named French. There's a copy I find now. It's at Chicago Historical. And it was there 16 years and never found it. But I mean, here's the guy who went broke three times trying to promote the Calumet. He got federal money in for the harbor. Yeah. Started the dock and dredge company to clean up the river. Planted himself in a nice little house at 128th of Michigan. Did he come up with the term Roseland? Yeah, he, he, he branded the little towns. Riverdale, Burnside, Roseland, South Chicago. And uh, died right there by the South Chicago Bank. Yes. He didn't even get to see Pullman finished. He, he was going to do something in South Chicago. And a, yeah, he went a, to a, a, a steam engine, a, a whistle on a steam engine, spooked his horse, the horse reared back, he broke his neck. A horse that he borrowed, or yeah. someone loaned him. He was going to walk home from South Chicago to Riverdale. That's the bank. Yeah, yeah, he's going to walk home. Yeah, he's going to walk. And uh, someone said, "Well, I have a little bit of wagon. You know, why don't you just use that?" Yeah, we weren't sure if he wrote him. We like to picture him taking the wagon down Michigan Avenue, looking at Pullman, and then turning. But he might have walked. I mean, we just don't know. According to the story that we have, he uh, the the horse was almost the horse and wagon were almost uh, forced on him. So he would be safe. So he gets to the crossing, which was at ground level then. Yeah. And the steam is released. The horse mm -hmm. reacts he fell, he fell and wrong. he fell on his head. And he, they, uh, I think they took him to a local hotel, and he died there. Yeah. Well, it's a heck of a guy. But there's so little about him. The eulogies are all fluff. Uh, there's there's just nothing. I don't even know where he's buried. I do. Very do you? Is he? Okay. Uh, in 1881, um, and he died in 1881. In 1981, we got some um, field trip money at Bowen. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I said, "Okay, we're going to Graceland." So we went to Graceland, and he's buried. There. He's not buried where all the really famous people are. It's um, in uh, sections of the farther south. He and his brothers were broke a lot. You know, they had this import-export company. Yeah, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of money, but, no. yeah. You, you get lucky well. every once in a while. A few years ago, we got the um, guest book for the Shed home, the Shed family. And the people that are in that are amazing, um, including, what was the 
the Alonzo last football Stead. coach of uh, Alonzo Stagg. Wow. Thank you, yes. Yeah. And, and people coming in from all over the country that, you know, are historically significant. And it was just in this little book. And somebody dropped it on us from Merrillville. I think she came in from Merrillville uh, and I just said, hey, would you like this? I remember who found it somewhere. You know, we get a lot of stuff like Miracles that. Miracles happen. So you get, you get lucky it. sometimes <laughs> with that stuff. You know, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so we don't know what tomorrow. That's, the, I guess, the beauty. You don't know who's going to walk in the door tomorrow yeah. you know, with something like that, too. But it's nice to get out and find this stuff, too. Dave, I have a question for Dave. The uh, Chicago or the Whiting uh, Historical Society, they're going into a museum. Do you have the, the, the yeah. information on that? Uh, you got to have to the mayor. They, they proposed to build a really nice museum at the end of 119th Street, but now they've got some other people they want to put in there as well. So I don't know where they're going to end up. They've got a really good partner with BP because BP you know, will help build. They were looking at a third, a third, and a third, and okay. one third was going to be do dedicated to local history. So they have great plans. I don't know. I mean, they have too many ideas and too many resources. They're okay. and, and MDS of what they have. So okay. they have their I, museum I, now, but their museum now is just temporary. That little that used to be yeah, a I, on 119th. Yeah. So I because I was talking to Gail, and she said that their focus now is on the new museum, but right. she, I, she didn't get, go into detail. But on they're. I have to say, the mayor was, I, I sat in on some of those meetings, their focus is on the museum that would be attractive to everybody, not what they have now, which is a nostalgia society with lots of, they want to tell a story, they want to focus on things, so it's actually okay. something you'd want to visit beyond somebody who lived here. And so I, I was very impressed with their ideas, but I don't know what happened. I know that they they had the money, they were ready to start, and then they had they had the, the Chicago Baseball Museum, which didn't go, but now they have the mascot museum, so they have that. And then they were talking to people about railroad, because people love railroad museums, so they talked about that. And asked the mayor, he'd probably tell you what the latest idea is. Well, I'll probably wait until the groundbreaking. You know, put in your two cents because now, they're, so. they're, Well, plan one, plan two. No, no, he, he actually was really open, but I really liked the idea that they were not going to do a nostalgia society. You know, he said, don't clean out your basements just yet, you know, bring all your, which is what they get. They get all the, you know. Oh, they set them over to. Yeah, we get a lot. We get a lot. Yeah. John, one of the things that I'm really drawn to in your list of collections is the recorded interviews with different people. Are, are those audio tapes or DVDs? Both. Uh -huh. That's both. It uh, kind of depended on what the funding was and you know what uh, people were looking for. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of interviews with World War II veterans, um, but that was in connection with an Illinois State project at the time. Um, and then I think Rod decided to kind of um, sort of freelance on that uh, because there were a lot of people who were missed or there were people who were sort of forced into answering certain questions because they were, it was a format you had to follow. And in the process, you lost the essence of the person, which was sad. It wasn't, you couldn't really, they couldn't tell their story. It was, it had to be within the framework. Yeah, oral interviews are touchy. We have technology problems with that too because some of it's VHS um, and it, that's harder to get into the digital universe. It's not impossible, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to get done, time consuming. And, and, but we, so some of the stuff is going to be hard to preserve. I can't wait for this voice recognition software to make it accessible. Make it cheaper, yeah. you know, because then you won't have to hire a secretary. I find that um, students here at CCSJ, um, one of the most effective ways to teach history is with interviews, especially if it's you know visual as well as audio. Um, I was thinking that we have uh, we have a lot of students of Latino background, and uh, we do have a Latin American history course coming up next semester, and it would be so wonderful if they could arrange a visit to you or. You know, uh, I would suggest also that um, they check out our, our Lady of Guadalupe Church, mm -hmm. which is the first Hispanic or first Spanish-speaking church mm -hmm. in Chicago, yeah. uh, and uh, generations continue to attend there, even though most of the uh, family members live elsewhere on Sunday mornings or for, for baptisms, weddings, whatever. It's quite busy. Any other questions or anything? 
Did you mention early on that you, you're open a little bit later or extra days when the model, model railroad club comes? First weekend of December. First weekend of December. That's yeah. what I first found out about you. Really? I'm going to go to the model railroad thing, saw right. your museum. It works that way for us because we get we get traffic from the from the uh, railroad room. That's a that's a fantastic space. If you've yes. seen it, you know. Yes. Uh, and it's it's also historical. It's been there for sixty, I think, sixty some years. Yeah, World War II. That's I think we started yeah. it. Wow. Yeah. And it's it's known nationwide among railroad fans, at least some of them. And it's a fantastic space. And that reminds me of something else that I forgot. <laughs> I was going to bring that that uh, Blues Brothers hat in because it was really remarkable. I forgot about that, but okay. Um, the Field House, Calumet Park Field House, has recently been designated as a cultural center, and I thought, like, so what does that mean? And I think what it means is that maybe um, we will be almost forced to be open uh, more frequently than we are. Uh, and maybe we'll be able to use some of the walls outside of our little space for displays and for activities. Uh, the person in charge of the field house is um, easy to work with. So, so we'll see how, where that goes, if that's something. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much thank for, you. for coming. This was fun. And, uh, and thank you, everybody. And our uh, next speaker in December will <laughs> be Sylvia. And she'll be talking about transportation and uh, a little bit of a little Calumet and maybe a little bit about Hegwish. Mostly the Calumet and Hegwish. Okay. And we need to celebrate and we need to have signs up. I mean, how many bridges do you cross and it doesn't tell you what you are crossing or where it got started and where it ends? Or all the bridges they're tearing down that were beautiful, and now all you get are Jersey barriers, and you don't even know you're going over water. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Terrible. And so you can stay focused on your cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 While you're driving. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you. This was fascinating. Thank you. Excellent. You got a uh, half an hour to vote. <laughs> I already voted.